Hi there. In this video, we are focusing on debits and credits from an accounting perspective. You don't need to memorize any complex rules or acronyms like dealer for example in order to understand them. My goal here is to give you a very solid understanding of how debits and credits work within journal entries. Whether you're new to accounting or you just need a refresher, this beginner's guide is going to walk you through all the basic steps one by one. I'll be honest here. I struggled to fully grasp debits and credits until I let go of what they mean in the real world. In everyday life, the terms debit and credit primarily relate to the movement of money in and out of your bank account. But in financial accounting, debit and credit are part of a broader system known as double entry bookkeeping. Their purpose is to track the financial health and activities of a business and not just the movement of cash. So we'll focus on their accounting specific roles in this video. I'm really very excited to share my experience and insights here with you. Let's get started. Before we explore journal entries with an example, let's briefly refresh our understanding of the foundation of accounting, that is the balance sheet equation. Think of the balance sheet equation like a snapshot of a company's financial position at any given point in time. The left side, our assets, represents everything the firm owns. The cash in the bank, the inventory on the shelves, even the buildings and machinery. This is the what the firm owns side of the equation. Now on the right side, we have liabilities and equity. Liabilities are what the firm owes to its creditors like loans, accounts payable and any other outstanding debts. Equity on the other hand represents the owner's stake in the company, their investment and any profits the business has retained. This is the what the firm owes section of the equation. The beauty of this equation is its simplicity. It tells us that everything a company owns must be balanced by what it owes to the others or its owners. It's the cornerstone of double entry bookkeeping, the system we use to track debits and credits, which we'll explore in more detail as we move forward. Here's a visual representation of journal entries, often referred to as T accounts. You'll see how we organize these entries with debits on the left side and credits on the right side. This simple structure allows us to easily track the flow of benefits within a company's financial transactions. As beginners, it's helpful to think of debits and credits in terms of the source and destination of a benefit. For example, when a company sells a product, the source of the benefit is the sale itself, which we credit. The destination of the benefit is the increase in cash or accounts receivable, which we debit eventually. This approach allows us to trace the flow of value through the company's accounts. It's a visual aid that helps us understand the relationship between debits and credits. It's a crucial tool for accurate bookkeeping. By following the path of benefit, we ensure that every transaction is properly recorded and the books remain balanced. Now let's look at another way of visualizing debits and credits. In this format, we list the account debited first, followed by the account credited with an indentation. This simple shift in presentation offers a different perspective on the relationship between these two fundamental accounting concepts. This visual arrangement aligns with the concept of cause and effect. The debit entry position first represents the effect or the outcome of the transaction. The indented credit entry position second reveals the cause or origin of that effect. Here is a crucial slide that summarizes how debits and credits work by taking the balance sheet equation into consideration. Remember, the equation must always balance. So every transaction affects at least two accounts with debits and credits working in tandem to maintain this equilibrium. Now here's the connection to debits and credits. For assets, debits increase the account balance, while credits decrease it. Think of it this way. If a company buys a new machine, that's an increase in assets. So we debit the asset account. If they sell some inventory, for example, that's a decrease in assets. So we credit the asset account. For liabilities and stockholders equity, the rules are reversed. Debits decrease these accounts while credits increase them. For instance, if a company takes out a loan, that's an increase in liabilities. So we credit the liability account. If they pay off some debt, that's a decrease in liabilities. So we debit the liability account. The same logic applies to stockholders equity. Stockholders equity is the owner's stake in the company representing the value of their investment and any retained earnings. 
We calculate retained earnings by starting with the company's revenue and then subtracting all expenses. When a company earns revenue, that increases equity. So we credit the equity account. When a company incurs expenses, that decreases equity. So we debit the equity account. By following these rules, we ensure that every transaction is recorded accurately and the balance sheet equation remains always in balance. All right, let's dive into an example to take our understanding of journal entries further. From here on, we'll break down each journal entry into three parts. In the first part, we'll discuss source and destination. We'll analyze the transaction under the balance sheet equation. Assets is equal to liabilities plus stockholders equity in order to ensure that it always remains balanced. This will highlight where the benefits are flowing from, which is the source, and where they are going to, which is the destination. In the second part, we'll be looking at the journal entry. We'll present the actual journal entry with the appropriate accounts that have to be debited and credited along with their respective amounts. In the third part, we'll be focusing on the impact on financial statements. We'll show how the journal entry affects the profit and loss statement and also the balance sheet. This will illustrate how the transaction impacts the company's financial position and performance. Let's break down the first transaction into our three-part analysis. On the 1st of January, Joe invests $5,000 of his own funds to set up a retail business. Okay, So Joe is investing $5,000 of his own money, which is the source, in order to start this business. We can see this money, the destination, flowing into the company as cash, which is an asset. This also increases Joe's ownership stake in the company, which currently stands at 100% because he's the sole owner of this company. Now, in order to record this transaction, we debit the cash account, which is the destination, by $5,000, showing the increase in our assets. We then also credit the contributed capital account. You can also call it the owner's capital or common stock, for example, okay, which is the source. We credit this account by $5,000, reflecting Joe's investment in the company. On our balance sheet, we'll now see $5,000 in cash under assets and $5,000 in owner's equity. This transaction doesn't affect our profit and loss statement because it's an investment. There is no revenue or expenses being accounted for here. It's simply a snapshot of how Joe's initial investment has changed our financial position. Moving on to the next transaction, on the same day, he rents an office space for $650 by paying cash. Okay, So Joe is using $650 of the company's cash, which is the source, in order to pay for rent. The destination of this benefit is the office space, which is an expense for the business. This transaction decreases the company's assets, which is cash, and also decreases owner's equity due to the expense. The balance sheet equation still remains balanced. To record this, we debit the rent expense account by $650, reflecting the increase in expenses. Okay? An increase in expense decreases the stockholder's equity. Right? Okay? Then we also credit the cash account by $650, showing the decrease in assets. On the income statement, we'll see a rent expense of $650, which will reduce our net income. On the balance sheet, our cash will decrease to $4,350 now. Okay, $5,000 minus $650 because we paid $650 in the form of rent. Our owner's equity will also decrease to $4,350 due to the expense reducing retained earnings. This transaction shows how paying rent affects both our income and financial position. Moving on to the next transaction, on the 5th of January, he buys 50 football shirts for $70 each by paying cash. Okay, so the business is using $3,500 of its own cash to purchase 50 football shirts. The destination of this benefit is the inventory account, an asset that increases in value by $3,500. Okay, this transaction decreases the company's assets, which is cash, and increases another asset, which is inventory. The balance sheet equation still remains balanced, even though the changes have happened on the same side of the equation. One account has gone up in value, another account has gone down in value, and hence, it still remains in balance. To record this purchase, we debit the inventory account, the destination of the shirts, by $3,500, increasing our inventory asset. We then credit the cash account, the source of the funds, by the same amount, 
showing the decrease in our cash assets. On the balance sheet, our inventory will increase to $3,500 while our cash will decrease to $850. Okay, so earlier we had cash of 4350. Okay, from that, if you remove 3500, you end up with $850 in cash. Okay, our owner's equity remains unchanged at $4350. This transaction doesn't affect our PL statement because it's a purchase of inventory, not a sale. It simply reflects a change in the composition of our assets. Moving on to the next transaction, on the 7th of January, Joe borrows $1,500 from a local bank. Okay, because now Joe is running low on cash, he needs to borrow some money to keep the company running. Okay, the local bank is the source of the funds, okay, providing $1,500 to the business. The destination is the company's cash account, which increases as a result of this loan. Okay, this also creates a liability for the business, which is reflected in the notes payable account. The balance sheet equation still remains balanced as before. To record this transaction, we debit the cash account by $1,500, increasing our assets. Okay, we then credit the notes payable account by $1,500, reflecting the new liability we've just taken on. Now on the balance sheet, our cash will now be $2,350. Okay, we had $850 plus the 1,500 now, so it's going to be 2,350, and we'll have a notes payable balance of $1,500. Our inventory and owner's equity remain unchanged, okay? This transaction doesn't affect our PNL either because it's just a loan, there's no revenue or expense involved. It again, simply shows how borrowing money changes our financial position. Moving on to the next transaction on January 16th, he fulfills an order from fixed ports for 30 shirts at a price of $100 each. The customer pays in cash. So the source of this transaction is the sale of 30 football shirts, which generates revenue of $3,000 for the business. Okay, This revenue leads to an increase in cash of the same amount. We also have a decrease in inventory as we've sold some of our stock. Okay, This decrease in inventory is the source of the expenses known as cost of goods sold. The destination of these benefits is cash increases by $3,000, okay, that's 30 shirts times $100, okay, and cost of goods sold increases by the cost of 30 shirts sold. We'll assume a cost of $70 per shirt because that was our purchase price, okay, so that's considered as the value of the inventory, okay, so the cost of goods sold increases by 70 times 30, which is $2,100. To record the sale, we have two parts. First, we debit cash by $3,000, reflecting the increase in our cash assets. Okay, We also credit sales revenue by $3,000, recognizing the revenue earned from this sale. Then, we debit cost of goods sold by $2,100, reflecting the expense of the inventory sold. Okay, We also credit inventory by $2,100, showing the decrease in our inventory assets. On the income statement, we'll see sales revenue of $3,000, and cost of goods sold of $2,100, resulting in a gross profit of $900. This will, in turn, increase our net income. Okay, On the balance sheet, cash will now increase to $5,350. Okay, Inventory will decrease to $1,400. We had inventory of $3,500 at the beginning. We've sold inventory worth $2,100. Okay, So what's left is $1,400. Owner's equity will increase to $5,250, reflecting the net income earned from the sale. Well, congratulations. You've just taken a very significant step towards understanding the world of journal entries, debits, and credits. While we've covered the fundamentals, there's so much more to explore in this topic and also accounting in general. Every other type of journal entry is an extension of what you've learned so far and I'm really confident that you can push forward from here. If you're eager to dive deeper and gain a comprehensive understanding of financial accounting, I invite you to check out my free video course. It's packed with in-depth explanations, practical examples, and valuable insights that will empower you to navigate the complexities of accounting with confidence. You can access this course through my website, joefusser.com, okay, or you can directly find it here on YouTube. I'm going to link it here at the end. Okay? Whether you're a student, entrepreneur, or simply curious about accounting, 
this course is going to help you with the knowledge and skills you need to succeed thank you for watching see you in the next one cheers